The Tom Woods Show, episode 2246. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, all you old timers out there from the Ron Paul 2008 campaign, you may remember my friend Larry Lapard, who spent $200,000 of his own money on full-page newspaper ads in support of Dr. Paul. Well, Larry has had an uncanny way with money over the years, and he made a presentation to my paid membership on how to insure yourself against currency debasement. That is to say, how to survive inflation. Well, I took that presentation out from behind the paywall, and I'm making it available to the general public for free. Check it out at tomwoods.com slash Larry. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. Delighted to have our old friend Brian McClanahan back with us. Brian has written, I don't know, 187 books. He's written the Founding Fathers Guide to the Constitution, the Politically Incorrect Guide to the Founding Fathers, Politically Incorrect Guide to Real American Heroes. Your Alexander Hamilton book, How Alexander Hamilton Screwed Up America, is very important. You've got a whole bunch of them, of course, as you well know, Brian, but also you do two educational things that people should know. You are one of the faculty members at libertyclassroom.com, which is my site that's been around for 10 years now. And you have your own academy, McClanahan Academy, where you can learn I mean, and talk about learning real history that is very, very hard to find. I mean, honestly, if you were to look around on your own with the kinds of topics Brian covers, good luck. McClanahan Academy, which I will link to on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2246, is the place to be for that. So welcome back, Brian. Well, thanks for having me. It's really been 10 years for Liberty Classroom. Yeah, 10 we, years? April 2012, we opened it. Wow. I go back and look at those old videos and I look so young. I know, I know. If only I had done only audio, so I wouldn't have to be haunted by this, you know. <laughs> but, you know, nothing you can do about it, right? You just have to do it as gracefully as you can. Right. <laughs> anyway, well, you got something wrong too. I have 188 books. Not 188. 188. Sorry, I forgot about Southern Scribblings. Yeah. I didn't put that yeah, right. One in that, there. that one. It that was the 188. Uh, 188. But by the way, have you our friend Kevin Goodsman, who also teaches at Liberty Classroom, and he and I wrote "Who Killed the Constitution" together. He has a book coming out, as you know, I think, in the next yes. couple of weeks called "The Jeffersonians" about the presidencies of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. That thing, not even counting the notes, that thing's over 500 pages. It's going to be a fantastic book. I'm really excited about that. Well, the thing uh, is, think that, he's read yeah. all the primary sources, right? He's got to it. Right. Yeah, I mean, maybe just a couple. I don't know. I'm really excited about it. And what he said is that he bases it entirely on Jefferson's first inaugural and how that filtered through the next 24 years, which is fascinating. I think it's a really interesting way to look at that 24-year period of American history. So I'll plug Kevin Guzman. I think everybody should go out and pre-order that and get it because yeah. I don't think you're going to be disappointed. No, no way. No way. And it's going to be a featured selection of the History Book Club. So that's a great thing for him. So I'll have him on in the relatively near future to talk about that. But that means I have to, I'm looking at it right now on my desk. I'm looking at this imposing tome right now thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not even on page one. <laughs> I got to get cracking <laughs> so we can have a good right. conversation. All right. Anyway, you of course, are the host of the Brian McClanahan show. And you comment on all kinds of things. You've got historical episodes, you've got current events. So kind of like this show. I mean, sometimes I do current events, but I'm not always as quick as other people to get to them. And so I tend to do more evergreen topics. But you covered something the other day about likely outcomes in 2024 and whether it's possible that a Biden running for re-election could actually win. And I think if you had asked people three, four months ago if that was possible, we would have said, of course not. I mean, he's a complete catastrophe in terms of his record, and everybody can see he's not coherent half the time. But now, you know, it's not so obvious that that's a definite loser. I don't think it is. I actually am going to predict now, and I said it on my show, that Biden's going to win. And I say that not because I think he's anything but an empty suit, but because of the way the states are shaking out now. Republicans have to be so good that they have to win all of the important battleground states just to make it because the Democrats have such an advantage in the Electoral College with states like California and New York. They're going to win those states. So Republicans have to run a perfect campaign in places like Ohio, in places like Wisconsin, in these battleground states. And I just don't know if they're going to be able to pull it off. And we know with the Democrats controlling some of these states and what they do with mail-in voting, 
the Republicans are at a serious disadvantage. They don't really know how to people tick like the Democrats do. And there was a tweet I saw, I think it was yesterday, about the actions in Pennsylvania and all the mail-in balloting and how the Democrats will actually go door to door and make sure they give people a mail-in ballot in places like Delaware County, Pennsylvania, which is essentially Philadelphia. And how important that was in Fetterman winning. I mean, Fetterman, who can't even put a coherent sentence together, wins the election because of the mail-in balloting. So this is why I would say that the Republicans should be really concerned about 2024. I think that Biden has a clear path of victory just because of the mechanics of how things are shaking out in the states now. It doesn't really matter if it's Trump or DeSantis. I'm not so certain either one of them can beat Biden because of that particular scenario shaking out for 2024. Well, first of all, can we say a quick word about this feud between DeSantis and Trump? It's entirely one-sided. It's bizarre to watch Trump lashing out at DeSantis. And I think DeSantis is handling it exactly the way he should, which is he made a remark that didn't have Trump's name in it, just reminding people to check out the scoreboard from the midterms, which meant, look at how decisively I was reelected. And I think that's what I would be advising him to do. Just act like Trump's not even there. How does it benefit him to engage with Trump? Just make him look like the more you know, well-put-together guy who's likely to have more general appeal. Oh, I think that's true. I mean, DeSantis' response to Trump and basically it was a non-response is the exact way to do it. Trump is behaving like a petulant little child. I mean, he this is Trump's personality, though. And this is what attracted people to Trump early on when he did this to the Democrats. But of course, we got to remember he did this to all the Republicans too. I mean, he was, some of his trolls were beautiful when he was trolling Ted Cruz and calling him, you know, having the Canadian Mounties come in. This stuff was gorgeous. I mean, it was so funny. And when he did it back in 2016, and I think Trump just playing the same old playbook now and hoping that people will still have this kind of reverence for these little sniping attacks. But the problem with this situation now is that DeSantis has got more popularity than any of those Republicans in 2016. So with Trump going after DeSantis, I think it's going to backfire on him in that way. Trump should, my advice to Trump would be, be more presidential, quote unquote, at this point and act like you are the front runner. You don't need to worry about who's behind you and just you are the president. You've been saying it for four years. You were not defeated in 2020. You really won. And so act like it. Grover Cleveland essentially did that. In 1888, he acted like he really was. He acted like he really was the man that won in 1888, and he actually did. And he just came back in in 92. So Trump is playing a game that I don't think is going to work out for him. I think people are going to see DeSantis as a better candidate because of that. You're already starting to see some of that happening. So as I said in my podcast, I think Trump could very easily just split off from the Republican Party and become a third-party candidate. I think that suits Trump more than anybody else in the last, say, 20 years. Not even Ron Paul was really willing to do that. And that's because of Ron Paul's personality. But Trump, because of his personality, I think would do it. And he wouldn't care. He doesn't care if it's collateral damage or anything else. He just wants to fuel his ego. So President Trump is an interesting character. I have, you know, I could say a lot of negative things about Trump too. So it's interesting how you're right, how this is shaking out and how these two people are Trump is taking barbs and DeSantis playing the high road. If you had to choose between these two, let's say, okay, just for the sake of argument, and you had to choose on the basis of who is going to do less damage to the country. Or do you feel comfortable giving us an answer? I think they're both, well, define damage to the country. How would you define well, that? I'll be generous and let you define it, whatever you would consider to be damage to the country. I would say that Donald Trump would have a nominally better foreign policy than Ron DeSantis. And when you go back and you look at the most important role of the president, which is foreign policy, I think Trump's foreign policy would be better. I think Ron DeSantis is going to be more like George W. Bush or even Joe Biden when it comes to foreign adventurism. I don't see him as being someone who's very interested in disengaging the United States from the European theater or doing things that would be in the best interest of the United States as a sovereign entity, the central government, if you want to say that long term. I mean, is Ron DeSantis going to go out and call out NATO like Trump did? which was absolutely outstanding. Is Ron DeSantis going to advocate a non-interventionist foreign policy? I don't think so. So in that way, I would say probably Trump is better in foreign policy and I would tend to gravitate more towards Trump. And of course, the other side of me that loves to see the chaos, because I think that's one thing we need to see. The president seems to be downgraded. Trump will do a better job of that than DeSantis. DeSantis is going to be 
a traditional kind of 21st century or late 20th century American president if he became president. He's going to be just like Joe Biden. You're going to have to have all the standards that you have to meet. It's going to be very, quote unquote, presidential, as I just mentioned. It's all going to fill in that way. And Trump was creating chaos, which in so many ways weakened the presidency. That's one thing that I always thought was important. I've talked about this before, but my roommate and I in graduate school, you sit around and joke about what would be the best thing that could ever happen to the presidency. It'll be someone like Trump. They come in, they gild, and they put gold plating on the White House walls, and they do all these outrageous things because people are going to become disgusted with the presidency. And the presidency is too powerful. We need to downgrade that office. And I think Trump would lead more to that than Ron DeSantis. So look, I think DeSantis is a great governor, but because of the way that, you know, and I talked about this Monday on my show, the way that DeSantis would be viewed, I think it would be more dangerous long-term than say a Donald Trump. Mm. Okay. That's interesting. But at the same time, despite the chaos of 2016 to 2020, I would say Joe Biden has as strong a presidency as ever. I don't think it did any lasting damage to the office per se. I'm not completely sure about that. And then in terms of DeSantis and his foreign policy, well, everybody's trying to speculate on this because although he is a governor, he was a congressman for some time. So we do have something to go on. And what we see when we look at his record is he'll pretty much vote along the lines that the GOP wants on things like official statements against the regime of Iran or an official statement about this or that. But it looks like, now again, once they get in office, they just abandon all their good instincts. But at least as of this moment, you can make a case that he's not as bad as some of them. So at the time of when Obama was intervening in Syria, he said the Obama administration has not articulated a clear objective for using military force in Syria, much less a plan to achieve that objective. The United States does not have an interest in assisting either side of the conflict or in refereeing a civil war amongst these warring anti-American factions. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's not terrible, but it's not somebody who's going to get in there and just start throwing out what don't seem wild to me, but seem to the media to be wild statements like, why do we still have all these troops in Germany? Why do we have all... I don't think he's going to ask those questions. No, he won't. And look, I'm not saying that DeSantis wouldn't be preferable to Biden. He would be. But in your point about Biden and his administration, he's more powerful than ever. I don't know. I mean, you look at how the people behind the scenes are running the administration. Biden really is a figurehead at this point. It doesn't appear like he even makes decisions anymore. We know now the bureaucracy is essentially running the executive branch. So is our view of the executive branch changed? I mean, we have Joe Biden, a guy that doesn't even matter. He was in his basement running for president. Basically, the Democrats were saying it doesn't matter who's there because we're going to run the show. So have we lost this kind of reverence for the presidency in many ways because of Trump or because of Joe Biden? I mean, Joe Biden is a catastrophe as well. So would a Ron DeSantis, who's bringing back this prestige, and that's what I talked about in the Jack Garrity piece that he wrote on how National Review could get behind Ron DeSantis because he's going to be more presidential and he's going to bring back the honor of the presidency. He's going to save it from Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Do we want that? I mean, do we want the presidency to have this kind of image that it had under George H.W. Bush, where it's the presidential cavalcade out there. But we know Biden did the same thing with the Queen's funeral. But we know this stuff is still going to be there. But people just laugh at Joe Biden. And when the Brit called him President Brendan, I thought that was absolutely hilarious. <laughs> they don't even know what his name is. It's President Brendan. It's the mix between Brandon and Biden. It was just funny. So I think that we've gotten to a point now where people are starting to laugh at the presidency. And some of it's Donald Trump. Some of it's Joe Biden. I don't know if I want to see a time because, I mean, people are going to think I'm just this complete anti-American person. I just don't think the presidency should be what it is. If I had to pick a candidate that would be the ideal candidate right now, it'd be someone like Rand Paul, who I think would do a better job in keeping the presidency within limits, the constitutional limits that it has, than any of these other candidates that we could run. So that's just my take on it. And again, I'm probably way on the fringe on this, but that's just what I think about the presidency and how the powers of the presidency should shake out. Well, I just remember the 2016 Rand Paul campaign. It was just uninspired. Yeah, it just was. And it was a disappointment because since then, he has turned out to be a far better senator than his presidential campaign would lead you to believe he is. He's been excellent on COVID. He's been excellent on Russiagate. He's been excellent on 
foreign intervention on the things that you get in real trouble for. For being good, he's been good. So maybe, I don't know, maybe he could generate some interest. His father was able to get away with saying things outside the approved spectrum because he was this kind of, he came across as this quirky old man who was obviously a smart guy, but just shot from the hip and was going to say whatever was on his mind. Rand is much more controlled and I'm not going to say focus group because I don't think that's what it is, but he's not going to be baited into answering a question about the civil war on face the nation. You know, he's just, he's not doing that. He's just, look, this is not what I'm here to talk about. But the thing is, I think it was partly that unpredictable quirkiness of Ron Paul that helped to account for the enthusiasm behind it because it made him seem like an actual person and not a, not an automaton. Right. Well, I think your point about that, though, is actually why I think Rand Paul would be a good president because he is measured enough. He stays focused on what he's there to do. And he's been so good on these other things and reigning in federal power, I think it would be better. And of course, Ron DeSantis has been excellent on the culture war and COVID and all those. He makes a great governor. I said it. Ron DeSantis needs to be the governor of Florida for four more years and make Florida even better. And what governors in the United States need to be doing is looking at Ron DeSantis and saying, let's all be like Ron DeSantis. We could have a real federal republic again. I mean, it could happen. This is why Ron DeSantis is beautiful in Florida. But as a president, would he take that same kind of mentality to the United States and then be a strong nationalist and do things that, I mean, look, we all know we want to own the other side and it's fun owning the libs. It's one thing that Donald Trump did. We all laughed at it when he would say things that were just so funny and would just completely make the other side cry. It's hilarious. Ron DeSantis has that quality too. And so that's funny, but we're more likely to get a left-wing fascist regime out of this extensive power than something that the left keeps saying, we're going to get Hitler in the White House if you get Ron DeSantis. It's completely stupid. But I mean, who are the real totalitarians? Well, it's the left. And when you keep giving this much power to the center, they're going to get it eventually and they're going to use it. And I think that's what you and I would agree on is the great problem in American history is that increasing power of the center. And how do we use it? Should the right be interested in reining that in? Or should we use it to own the other side as we get power knowing that the day's going to come when they're going to do it to us too. I just can't get over though, Brian, thinking to myself that they're going to do it to us whether or not we do it to them. You think these people care about precedent? These are, that's the last thing that's on their minds. Yeah. So some people will want to come on my show and say, it's very sweet that you have your nice principles. And so when you're being loaded in the boxcar, we'll let you sit right up front with all the other people who had principles. Whereas maybe now's a time to think, well, maybe my principle should be I fight back against people who want me dead. Maybe that should be our new principle. Look, I see it. This is what Trump was doing. DeSantis does in Florida, which is fantastic. So I mean, this is the way that a lot of the nationalists are starting to speak about this. We need to use the apparatus that we were given to go get them. Um, and again, I guess because I'm looking at this from an original constitution standpoint, and I know what the founding generation said about these things, and I know where they would go with this. We should be doing everything we can to try to get rid of that so nobody can do this and have a real federal republic, have the state stand up. I mean, COVID was beautiful for federalism because it allowed someone like Ron DeSantis to come and say, you know, we're keeping Florida open. We can have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez come down here and vacation without a mask on, and we can show her being the hypocrite that she is. Because obviously, if this was a problem, she'd be wearing her mask even in Florida, but she knows it's not a problem. So we're going to keep Florida open. We're going to keep Texas open. We're going to keep Alabama open. I mean, I tell people all the time in Alabama, it was almost like nothing ever happened. Everything just kind of operated like normal. You had to wear your mask if you went into some places and it was ridiculous. But for the most part, people just kind of did whatever they wanted and nobody said a word about it. But if you went to some place like New York, which was a leftist reign or California, we know it was miserable and it still is miserable in these places in many cases. And so the real point of my show, of course, Think Locally, Act Locally, is try to make your state and your community as great as you can and not really worry about the presidency so much because it's not really designed to be what it is. And so for me, whether it's DeSantis or Trump, I think they're both going to be nationalists and they're both going to do things that I don't like. Joe Biden's going to do the same thing. I try to think about foreign policy. And as you said, Maybe DeSantis does the right thing. I just don't know if he would be anything other than, like, if National Review is trumpeting Ron DeSantis, we've got to take some pause and think, well, what does this really mean for the presidency? Are they going to worm their way into this administration and try to 
make it more like uh, their view or is it going to be something else? Hey, folks, quick sponsor message via Woods here. Let me tell you something. With Christmas coming, there are a lot of gifts you can get people that they're absolutely going to hate. But there are fantastic and unique gifts that nobody else is going to get them that they're going to love. Why not get one of those? And an excellent, excellent gift idea this Christmas is a big old box of Omaha Steaks. The Woodses have been eating Omaha Steaks for well over a dozen years. We love the convenience, the value, and the quality. Absolutely delicious, and what a great gift idea. The steak experts at Omaha Steaks have put together special curated gift packages that will help make you a Christmas hero. So go to omahasteaks.com and use code WOODS at checkout to get $30 off your order. Send an assortment of mouth-watering favorites guaranteed to impress, like the legendary Butcher's Cut Filet Mignon, air-chilled boneless chicken, ultra-juicy burgers, the burgers are ultra-juicy, and even easy-to-prepare comfort meals that are ready in a flash. Omaha Steaks is ready to ship your order right away, so shop early and beat the shipping rush. Go to omahasteaks.com and use promo code WOODS at checkout to get that extra $30 off your order. Minimum order may be required. If you were advising one of these candidates, what issues do you think ought to be emphasized. Obviously, there are hundreds of issues. You could talk about agriculture policy. You could talk about milk subsidies or whatever, but you're not going to. You're, you're going to pick a few. Like Trump picked a few. He had the wall. He had trade deals, whatever. At least you knew where he stood because he would answer your other questions, but his emphasis was on three or four things. What do you think those should be? I think it should be the same things. Look, Americans are worried about the culture war on the right. It really is the red meat. What can we do to prevent all these weirdos from doing stuff in our schools. So that's one. Immigration still is a concern for a lot of Americans, though I don't know if it's as high up as right now as it was, say, four years ago or six years ago. But I think a lot of Americans are still concerned about it, particularly in border states and the economy. The Trump did it in a way, though, that was very old style Democrat. And I mean, I've made this case many times. Trump was simply just echoing someone like Pat Buchanan. If you're a Republican in 2024 and you're running for president, you should think of Pat Buchanan in 1992 because that's what Trump was doing. So we want blue collar jobs. We want to make sure we have manufacturing in the United States and we want to make sure that we have American jobs for Americans. Joe Biden is saying the exact same things. Also, I think that we, he, whoever's running should talk about real federalism and talk about the beauty of having the states decide a lot of these issues that really should be at state level, whether it's COVID. I mean, Trump recognized that when Biden gets into office, he says the exact same thing. And he's a hero for this. DeSantis could go out and talk about his great policies and what he did in Florida and how the state should lead on these things. And I should be hands off on this and let the states do what they want to do. But certainly it's the culture war stopping the woke stuff and the economy and saving blue collar jobs. And Being positive about America. I mean, you think this is something that Trump did very well. It was being positive about the United States and what it meant to be an American. And that whole slogan, Make America Great Again, was fantastic. I mean, it really was a beautiful slogan that people could gravitate to. And I go back again to Jimmy Carter in the Malay speech, which was actually a very good speech. It was written by a guy named Pat Cadell, who was uh, from South Carolina. And Pat Cadell was a young guy and he wrote the speech and everyone panned it because they thought he was picking on Americans. But what he was actually doing is saying, look, we're great. We've just kind of gotten this funk. Let's get out of it. We're still great people. Let's do great things. That was Make America Great Again in 1979. So whoever it is, Trump or DeSantis, needs to do that again. I think Trump has too much baggage, though. I really do. I, I don't think that he could win just because of the baggage now. So I think DeSantis, Republicans would see him as a more ideal candidate. I just you know, have some questions about what he's going to be if he is the candidate in 2024 and what he would be as president. I think there still could be some issues with President DeSantis that frankly would be dangerous in foreign policy in particular. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. There are definite concerns and we all concede his good points. The very fact that he appointed Joseph Latipo to be the Surgeon General of Florida is unbelievable. I mean, Latipo is absolutely rock solid. He is totally against the totalitarian public health establishment. He makes them crazy. I just, I cannot get over what a great pick that was. I mean, that's something, Mitt Romney, if he were governor of Utah, would never appoint a Joe Latipo over his dead body. He would appoint a Dr. Fauci. Right. 
And I think that's the great thing about DeSantis. I mean, this is why I would say if we could get Rand Paul to run a good campaign, I think he would be a very strong candidate against Ron DeSantis because I think he's stronger on some other issues. Rand Paul would not be a bomb Iran kind of guy. He wouldn't be a pro-Ukraine. We got to spend billions of dollars in Ukraine. He would not be pro-NATO. He would not be any of that. And he would be just as strong on opposing the Fauci's of the world as, say, Ron DeSantis would. And he would be just as strong in the culture war, I think. So yeah, this is where, and again, I'm telegraphing who I would support if I could pick a candidate. It would be someone like Rand Paul or, or Ron DeSantis. Either one is preferable to Joe Biden. But as I said in the opening, I just don't know if Joe Biden's going to lose because of the way the Democrats have kind of rigged things yeah. in states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin. And with more people leaving those states and moving to Florida or Texas, it's making it even easier for the Democrats to win those states. It's true. It's true. Although I suppose Nevada is not really a state that there's been huge outflow from, although I could be proven wrong on that. But in Nevada, the issue was in the U.S. Senate race, the Republicans could have made up that difference if more of them had come out to vote. They just didn't. There were still plenty of them. They're just not being activated to the get out the vote machinery is not functioning or something. Right. And this is what I said. The Democrats are more people tick right now. They're going and knocking on doors. They're getting people to come out. They're being aggressive in ways that Republicans are. And I think some of that is malaise with Trump. I do. I mean, I think that all this has shocked people and they're afraid of being called names. Well, you you support January 6th insurrection. You're an election denier. These slogans and platitudes, they don't want to be called names. And so they're just staying home. And when Mitch McConnell won't put any money into some of these campaigns, or you've got bad candidates like Herschel Walker or Dr. Oz. I mean, these candidates were horrible. Why? The Republicans are stupid. They really are the grand old stupid party. And as they continue to act like that, and we're going to see them lose elections. All right, last thing. If DeSantis and Trump both run, obviously they are splitting a certain vote. On the other hand, every poll that's been done so far shows the two of them so dominant in the field that even if they both ran, the Trump populist message is so surprisingly dominant within the Republican Party right now that it wouldn't necessarily ruin that because who, Nikki Haley? I mean, who are the plausible alternatives to this? So they could even go up against each other without necessarily undermining their cause. But at the same time, the two most plausible people would be hitting at each other all the time, I suppose. What do you think about this? This is where I said I think Trump is going to run third party. I do believe that DeSantis is going to be more palatable and he's got a better image. I mean, he. I mean, look, you can't deny the fact that Ron DeSantis steamrolled Chris in Florida. It was laughable. It was so bad. And DeSantis barely won. People forget that. DeSantis barely won the first election for governor. So the fact he's created this machine in Florida is really impressive. And he's polished. And he is not going to shoot from the hip like Donald Trump. He's more predictable. And so I think the moderates in the Republican Party are going to rally around Ron DeSantis more than they would Donald Trump. But this is where I say, I do believe this. I think Trump is going to bolt if he doesn't get the nomination and he is going to run third party. I don't see him staying and supporting whoever the candidate is. And I don't think that's in his personality. He's had the taste of power. He wants it back. And I think that he would bolt and go third party. And that's going to, of course, weaken the Republican Party more than the Democratic Party. I mean, I don't see many Democrats voting for Donald Trump. He's the American Hitler now. So I think that if that happens, Joe Biden wins easily. But this is Trump's ego. I don't know if anybody's going to coax him out of this potential third party run because there are committed people to Donald Trump. They believe Trump was railroaded. They think that Trump's the legitimate president. They think Trump won. And he deserves another four years. And Ron DeSantis is going to create chaos there and cause problems. This is why I've also predicted, I don't think that the Democrats are going to indict Donald Trump. I don't think it's going to happen. I think they're going to come up with some charges, but there's not enough evidence, et cetera, et cetera. But they've run him through the mud now, but they're going to want him to be able to stay in the race so that he can create chaos and the Democrats maintain the executive branch from 2024 through 2029. I think that's what happens ultimately. That's got to be their strategy. They'd be idiots to put this guy away. They want to keep him. He is the biggest fundraiser they've ever had. Yeah. By far. If they put him away, I have less respect for the Democratic Party as strategists than ever before because 
This is something they've always excelled at. You know, Nancy Pelosi, for all of her problems, she was so good at strategy and doing things parliamentarian wise that were just, I mean, insidious, but they worked. And the Democrats have always been better at this than the Republicans. And so if they lock Trump up, which is, of course, you go on to Twitter or wherever and you see all the people lock him up and all this. I just, I don't see it happening. Again, they're going to come up with some things. Well, you know, this is it. And then they're going to let him stay in there and they're going to let him go and run for president so that if he does win the nomination, they've got that. If he doesn't win the nomination, he's created chaos and might run third party. And then, then at that point, then they might consider locking him up for something. So if he doesn't win, then they can maybe put him in jail and finally do away with Donald Trump. But I think 2024 is going to be a real disappointment for people that think that Joe Biden is going to go down in flames and we're going to see the Republicans come back and win. I thought that this last election cycle would have been a sure fired landslide for the Republicans and look how badly they did. I was pretty shocked by it, actually. And again, it's the grand old stupid party. They just don't know what they're doing. And they had a perfect opportunity. Inflation's at 40 year high. You've got all these people that are struggling financially. You've got the culture war, but they just don't know how to capitalize on anything. They don't know how to message. And we saw what happened. They barely squeaked by in a majority in the House. And they're going to probably lose the Senate overall. I thought that Herschel Walker would win in Georgia, but it just doesn't look like it's going to happen. I think Raphael Warnock's going to win that runoff election pretty easily, actually. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I wonder if the 2022 results have had the effect of demoralizing people who wanted to fight the Biden folks or energizing them. It's hard to know. I've seen both. Yeah, I don't know either. The Dobbs decision, I think, did a lot to energize some people in some areas of the United States. But I think what's amazing about that, too, and I talked about federalism, I think a lot of leftists have figured out, well, you know, not a whole lot changed for me if I live in a place like California. I mean, I woke up today after the Dobbs decision. It was just like it was yesterday after the Dobbs decision. And so they're starting to understand that federalism really does work in your state, that you can still be protected in your state. And you don't have to worry about what people in, say, you know, if you're in California, what people in Alabama do. And so that's okay. Or you don't have to worry about if you're in Alabama, what people in California do. You just do what you want. You have your laws the way you want them, and they're structured the way you want. And that's the way it works. So as far as demoralizing after the 2022 election, I think that some people are starting to think about what they could do better. But I do see that there's kind of a malaise right now. Well, we should have won. We didn't win. Everyone's blaming Mitch McConnell for this or that. And so where do we go from here? I don't know. Again, the grand old stupid party will always disappoint you. If you put your faith in the Republican Party, you're bound to be disappointed. And of course, to your your statement, you always get John McCain. No matter what you do, you get John McCain. So <laughs> when you vote Republican, that's ultimately what you get. Do you think, let me ask you this, do you think Ron DeSantis would be better than John McCain? Yeah, well, <laughs> that is my old saying. I think Trump was something of an exception to that. but. It could be that DeSantis is absolutely great on foreign policy, but if he turned out to be John McCain, just knowing the way the system works, that wouldn't exactly come as a shock to me. So we definitely have some unknowns here. Brian, what would be a good link so people want to follow Brian McClanahan further? Where should they go? Just go to brianmcclanahan.com. That's Brian with an O. And I've got everything that I do there, the podcast, all the other stuff, the books, the academy, of course, Liberty Classroom, all that stuff. So it's all there. And I'd love for your listeners to come on and follow me there. I know a lot of them do. So come on over. Yeah, Brian's one of the good guys. Now, maybe you won't agree with Brian and everything. That's what makes life fun, you know? Makes life fun that there are differences here and there. But Brian's a good man. And I want people who teach real history. So that's why I basically brought on Kevin and Brian. And then I ran out of people so <laughs> that I could find. But that's not entirely true. But it's, it's closer to the truth then I feel comfortable admitting, (laughs) given that that's our situation in the world today. But it means Brian is one of the best, really is one of the best we have. So check out brianmcclanahan.com, B-R-I-O-N, mcclanahan.com. I'll link to that also at tomwoods.com slash 2246. All right, thanks, Brian. Chances are I won't... Oh, no, wait, you and I are going to do a live Liberty Classroom Q&A. Yes, we are. So I was going to say I won't probably talk to you before Christmas, but I will. So I'll wish you a Merry Christmas then. Okay, good deal. All right, thanks, Brian. Nice stuff. All right, folks, that is another episode of The Tom Woods Show. I will see you tomorrow. 
Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.